Hi, um, good morning. This is Ashish from Eclay, South Asia. I welcome you all to uh, the webinar today. This is a, this is the fourth webinar in a series of uh, webinars that we have been uh, sharing with the participants. The last three webinars were focusing on various components of mobility. And today's webinar is focusing on ECBC compliance in Indian cities. Uh, today's webinar is based on interactions and discussions with project partner cities, various state ECBC cell officials, and experts from BEE. It forms part of the work done under a project called Handholding Technical Support to Smart Cities, uh, focused on Gwalior, Ludhiana, Udaipur, and Vishakhapatnam, um, covering urban sustainable urban built environment and mobility. The work um, uh, has been uh, possible through funding support from Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation. And the format for today's uh, webinar would be, I would share some slides on our uh, work um, and findings on ECBC compliance in Indian cities. We will uh, follow it up with some comments from um, experts who are joining us. We have today with us Ms. Smita Chandiwala from Energy Se and uh, Ms. Nandini Sharma from Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation. After that, we can pick up questions that the participants have uh, for the presenter or the experts. So I start with the presentation. This is the format of the presentation today, we go over the smart city mission a bit, and then we talk about ECBT specifically in the cities that we've worked on. So a recap on the uh, smart city mission. This is a, centrally, um, a mission operated as a centrally sponsored scheme of the government of India, uh, anchored by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, focuses on inclusive and sustainable development in compact cities, creating a replicable model for other cities, uh, provision of efficient urban mobility, affordable housing, and sustainable environment are part of the core infrastructure elements of this mission. If we look at the number of and variety of projects that have been suggested for implementation as part of the various smart city proposals, we notice that housing and energy and environment components which include the built environment um, overall, are forming around 18% of the uh, funding requirement for projects across various cities. This is not a small percentage and uh, tells us the importance of looking at um, urban built environment in cities, smart cities specifically. just wanted to share that uh, what I'm going to tell you about the uh, ECBC compliance in Indian cities is uh, coming from our learnings through interactions um, in the cities and the states um, of uh, Ludhiana, Gwalior, Udaipur and Vishakhapatnam. In the past, we have also worked in Jaipur and Kakinara. And so um, interactions and discussions in terms of the building approval process as is currently and as will be in future based on uh, the ECBC compliance requirements has informed this presentation. So um, in terms of the process that was followed, um, we've, we've begun with a desktop background study of ECBC, the Energy Conservation Building Codes um, it, within India, and have tried to understand it from the perspective of various various states and how this is happening within the various states. Using this information, we have carried out a detailed study of the status of ECBC implementation within the cities and the related states through our uh, colleagues who have been based in the cities 
um, throughout this project engagement period. This has also been checked with then the uh, officials involved in building approval processes within the municipal corporations for the development authorities in the cities and an interaction with officials responsible for the same at the state level. This has then uh, been also uh, checked with uh, officials within the BEE or their partner agencies at the national level to get an understanding of how things are happening for ECBC compliance within the cities. And together with that, we have also specifically interacted with the SDA or the ECBC state um, sales and professionals to uh, gather understanding on what to tell cities about ECBC uh, compliance and implementation process. Basis that we have developed a draft of a guideline document that will soon be available for cities to look at what is expected of them when they are wanting to become ECBC compliant. So a bit of um, the background. Um, In India, the building sector today consumes around 33% of the total energy produced at present. And by 2047, it is expected to increase to 55%, which is huge. Um, and an electricity demand in uh, the residential uh, buildings is projected to include, increase by five folds and three folds in the commercial building sector by 2032. Now the ECBC, the Energy Conservation Building Boards, was developed to manage the electricity demand in buildings through the ECBC Act. And so is a very relevant code to look at. Going back to the Smart City Mission, uh, we wanted to note that one out of the 14 essential features mentioned in the Smart City Mission focuses on energy efficiency in buildings. And one out of the 21 recommended smart solutions also focuses on energy efficient and green buildings. There are also two related features, which are uh, smart meters and management and renewable sources of energy that are mentioned as part of the 21 smart solutions. So it's it's all uh, all guidance that goes out to cities uh, who want to become smart, saying that um, energy efficient and green buildings is one of the things that they can focus on when they are wanting to implement projects under the smart city mission. So. If we look at uh, the energy conservation building codes policy map, we see that uh, the we see that the ECBC commercial uh, came in around 2007, and uh, we are right now in 2019. The most recent um, developments in the energy conservation building co codes roadmap has been the ECBC rules that have been notified through Gazette in 2018. We have the uh, draft industrial ECBC uh, codes again in 2018 and the Eco Nevas Samhita which focuses on residential buildings in 2018. So a lot is happening uh, in the ECBC space. Of these three codes, the codes for commercial buildings is now mandatory. Residential is voluntary, and the industrial codes are still in their draft form. So um, it's required by uh, building approval agencies to make sure that buildings that fall within the category of uh, ECBC commercial are ECBC compliant.
want to go over a bit on the ECBC commercial. So ECBC commercial, ECBC 2017 is applicable and mandated for commercial building now. Um, the types of buildings that are included in the ECBC commercial include hospitality, education, healthcare, shopping, assembly, and businesses. So all of the buildings that fall within these use categories and are having a, connect, a connected load of 100 kV or a contract demand of 120 kVA need to comply with the ECBC codes. So getting down to the specifics then. When talking about what to tell cities about ECBC compliance, um, we looked at the building approval process that is followed at the local level, at the ULP level. And we notice, um, what you notice in the slide in white is the process that already exists in any city for building approval. And what you notice in light green are steps that will be added or are already added for the building approval process to in, include um, ECBC compliance requirements. What you see within the light blue square box are the actions that will have to be taken at the city level for ECBC compliance, which includes um, before submitting the building approval documents and certificates to um, the ULB, uh, the involvement of an energy auditor to carry out the uh, compliance check and submit and develop the forms for submission. The same to be submitted to the ULB together with the various other building no objection certificates, approvals, um, and other certificates to the ULB. A check of the same by the ULB and basis that approval of grant by the ULB for uh, initiating construction, a compliance check during the construction and after it to seek compliance. Um, and this is what will be uh, really happening at the local level to see that new buildings that fall within the required categories um, are ECBC compliant. So it appears quite simple and possible to do. Um, at the local level, not 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 many requirements from from uh, municipal officials to be able to actually make the new commercial buildings of certain sizes to be ECBC compliant. However, If you want to see the complete picture, this is how it is. What you see in uh, white are the existing approval processes, and what you see in green are the new action points where uh, changes would be there because of ECBC uh, regulations. And, uh, the box that is enclosed within the green dotted line is the action area specifically for ULBs or municipal corporations or development authorities providing the building approvals. If I, if I go through the process um, for the benefit of participants, we will have to begin with the proposal and design of uh, building wherein uh, and energy auditor buildings may be approached for assistance. The uh, EAB checks compliance and provides recommendations to be able to make sure that uh, uh, the new building is complying with ECBC. The same are to be submitted by the developer or the owner 
for approval to the ULB or Development Authority. These then are verified and checked by the ULB or Development Authority. Upon any doubt, and this is important, it is possible for the municipal corporation or development or authority officials to approach the state designated authority, which is the body at the state level responsible for ECBC uh, compliance at, across the state um, to seek guidance. Within the SDA is also the ECBC cell, which currently exists across all the states in India that can then um, offer this technical assistance of carrying out a, a check on a document that has been submitted for approval. Uh, basis a review of the uh, document submitted, the uh, ULB may allow construction to begin, which may be checked during and post completion of construction by the energy auditor building. Uh, to provide uh, approval and occupation certificate by the UN. So this is in effect the entire uh, process that would be followed. Just wanting to highlight that at the state level uh, within the SDA, uh, we also have an ECBC technical grievance redressal committee and a compliance monitoring uh, team within the SD. And the same similar structure also exists higher at the state level for a redressal of any issues that might be arising on ground. In this slide, we wanted to share with you the roles that various actors play in uh, ECBC implementation. Um, you can see that across across from the center to the ground level, uh, you can see that the ECBC amendment and notification is mostly uh, to be done after the uh, central act at the state and the local level. Um, the building uh, bylaws or approval processes need to be notified either through unified bylaws at the state level or at the local level as the case may be. It may also include any incentives uh, to start off action on ground. And uh, certification and reports would then be done at the ground within cities by say the energy auditor, buildings and similar professionals. A very important component of awareness and capacity building is done uh, throughout across the various levels of actors involved in this process. And uh, monitoring role uh, is primarily retained by the state and the central uh, bodies. Now looking at this um, kind of a compliance uh, requirement that is there um, at the city level. Uh, we also wanted to share our understanding of what is happening across states in India. Uh, what we notice is that we have around three types of uh, uh, building approval process stages that we see across states in India. Um, the first criteria the first category of states is our states that have incorporated ECBC bylaws um, within the building approval process, either through a unified uh, bylaw or through local bylaws um, at the city level. The second uh, category are states which have not yet incorporated ECBC mandate in bylaws, but they have adopted and notified it. And the third category of the states are which have not yet notified or amended ECBC, but have initiated capacity building. So you see the three categories that are there. What is, what is worth remembering is that no matter which category your state falls in, we have within each state uh, under the state designated authority an ECBC cell which is manned by 
professionals who can offer technical advice and uh, uh, trainings for municipal officials who need and want to know more about the ECBC process to be followed at their city level. And so we want to say that the integration process is already going on. Uh, some of the specific actions that are still ongoing and required are that uh, we need more uh, awareness among the local authority officials regarding their roles in uh, the building approval process to become ECBC compliant. And at the policy level, uh, most of the national and state level policy framework already exists and is well known. It is for the state or the cities to enact bylaws that mandate ECBC. We saw that a lot many of the states already have this, but the ones that do not have this will need this to happen. And the most, uh, most recommended way of doing this would be to have this uh, included as part of an online building approval system that majority of, say, the smart cities are wanting to put in place in coming time. So in terms of process, this is it. But uh, it's, it's, it's worth noting um, as to what this means um, in terms of changes on ground, changes procedurally, changes in terms of cost, and changes in terms of results that one sees um, through becoming ECBC compliant. We notice that for a city, there is almost no change in terms of the procedural requirements to become ECBC compliant. Um, as, as explained earlier, at the step where in any case, um, developer or an owner was submitting uh, documents from various departments, no objection certificates and compliance certificates, this would be another um, uh, compliance doc document that would be required to be submitted. Um, in terms of costs, we see no changes in costs um, at the city level. However, for the building owner or the designer, we do expect a minimal cost um, increase for appointing an EAB and carrying out the assessment and filling up the compliance form. In terms of results, we will we, we expect to see measurable reduction in energy consumption in specific buildings. At the city level, uh, depending on the number of ECBC compliant commercial buildings, you would be able to say how much of energy is being saved because these buildings are now ECBC compliant. Of course, nationally, there'll be major impact um, at the state and the national level in terms of energy savings through becoming ECBC compliant. So it's, it seems like not very complicated and a lot of positive results that we see on, on ground for, for us to become ECBC compliant. So this is all that uh, we had to share today for uh, for your information on as cities on becoming energy uh, conservation building codes compliant. Uh, what we observed while we were collecting information from uh, municipal officers was that there is still a not very clear understanding of what is expected of the cities. And so we thought through this exercise we would be able to make very clear uh, recommendations on what is expected. And as you saw in the presentation, there's very little that is expected from the municipal corporation specifically or the development authority to change to become ECBC compliant. And, and a lot of thought has been put to put in, uh, recommend a structure that is then uh, allowing new buildings to become ECBC. Thank you. So uh, 
following this, I think it would be great if um, I can invite our expert in house here today with us, uh, Smita Chandiwala, to offer some comments. And uh, we could then probably ask her a few questions that might be useful for everybody to hear answers for uh, Smita. Um, thanks, Ashish. Um, so, you know, it will be very interesting to hear from the cities uh, their, what they'd like in terms of assistance for code implementation. But um, the code has been around for a while, it's been upgraded, and uh, it's um, not going away, <laughs> right? So, I think uh, we need to sort of think um, and work towards its implementation. Uh, this great effort done across studies and uh, including this one to map the process. And uh, there is enough expertise now developed across the supply chain of um, technical assistants, experts, architects, uh, which are all available for the cities to now um, tap into to make this process uh, workable. and. Uh, you know, we're we're hoping to hear from you to see what 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 assistance you make to do this. Um, thank you, thank you, Sita. Um, I think I have uh, some questions from my side that I would want uh, your reactions to, and then probably we can take up some questions from the audience. Okay. Um, I think we can begin with the first question which is about as you saw the process of ECC compliance on ground is not exactly very simple however it has been made fairly simple for the ULBs or the approval authorities um, as, as described in the presentation do you think in future we should look at mainstreaming the technical staff um, such as energy auditors within the buildings divisions in ULBs. Uh, just some thoughts would be useful. Um, sure. So I think mainstreaming technical staff in ULBs, uh, of course, would be ideal. But uh, that said, we also need to understand that uh, ULBs deal with a lot of um, our urban issues, and staff is always, um, you know, is. is there are loads of responsibilities for them. Uh, right now, where the code compliance is, um, and in the near future also, I particularly don't think that they need a lot of technical staff as much as a basic awareness of what is required for compliance and for them to be able to carry out that process. Um, a lot of the capacity building programs of the government, hence, are trying to do exactly this. Um, this, this is a code, uh, uh, what does it do, what does it require, and what is specifically the uh, ULB's role in this. So uh, what I would suggest and recommend is that um, how do we first look at making this part of our documentation process when a building comes in for an approval. Um, enforcement, compliance check at the construction stage, all of those are uh, next level steps, but initially to get uh, builders, developers, architects to even take note of the code, um, we should have a two to three year period where cities make it mandatory for the design stage documentation to come in when buildings ask for approval. Uh, um, and this would sort of you know, start the process of Everybody looking at what requirements are needed, how do we meet ETBC, and the next steps will become um, clear. Um, you know, the problems that arise in the process would, would sort of come on the surface, and we will have time to be able to resolve them contextually. So, um, uh, in terms of not having technical staff necessarily at the ULP, but um, SDAs um, have. Um, you know, responsibility. There's an ECBC cell set up in the state with technical staff. There are enough master trainers being uh, and auditors and uh, third-party assessors that have been trained, and all of those are available to reach out 
for technical assistance. But the um, mandate for documentation has to be something that the ULB takes the lead on. So, um, Great. Thank you. Thank you, Smith. Are you able to know that? Uh, before I ask the next question, I want to remind the participants that uh, you're able to share additional questions by typing in your questions within the webinar uh, format that's there. You can see that there's an opportunity to raise questions, and if you have any, we create it here at those in your time for such so the next question from my side to Smita is that, uh, as we saw, that ECBC policy space has been fairly dynamic and vibrant nationally. Definitely at this stage has this as well, but nationally we had a lot of uh, policies being discussed and uh, developed and announced. For ULB officials who are responsible for um, implementation and enforcement, how do you expect them to keep track of the latest that's happening or the latest that's required to be followed uh, within these files? Um, I think it's really for the um, SDA to be able to um, keep the state and the cities in front of, um, uh, you know, what, what are the requirements? Um, but that said, there is still um, flexibility in terms of the cities wanting uh, of how and uh, when to start implementing it. So um, I would say, since the SDA are getting information directly from um, centrally from the BEE, that's their. Um, his point of contact to uh, get any information. And uh, now that the code has been updated, I hope we're not going to see a lot more changes anyway. So. Great. Do you have any advice on uh, developing uh, something like the coordinate that Singapore has, which, which is sort of a clearinghouse and information portal for everything to be with and linked for anybody who's interested? All updates are regularly put there. So, um, architects, technical people, as well as uh, building owners and developers are able to know what's the latest that they need to follow for becoming compliant on all codes that um, That'd be great. Um, I have to say I'm not sure if currently something like that really exists, though uh, I do know that uh, Something like this was, was attempted um, a few years ago uh, as a Shakti Foundation project, in fact. But uh, I think we were a little uh, ahead of time in the sense that uh, the code itself needs to be uh, picked up by the industry to be looking for those answers, right? A community and a, a, a website is as useful when people access it. So. Um, if there is enough demand, I'm sure there is. Uh, there'd be ways to get this on board, but it's it was a great idea, and it would uh, really help um, not just the teams but all practitioners to know uh, what's required, and if there are any changes that are coming up. Okay, um, we have two questions from participants, so I think we can we can pick up one after the other, and it'll be great if the expert can. Um, responses. So one question is that as a building owner, how can one proceed for compliance? What steps should be taken? Um, great, thank you. So as a building owner, um, you um, you know um, you need to go get um, a design stage. Uh, um, inputs from your, your design team, right? So whether it's an uh, it's an architect, or cons um, HVAC consultants, or um, anybody involved with technical knowledge of the code, um, to be able to make that building uh, ECBC compliant, uh, and uh, work with them, you know, design. 
um, understand the requirements. Uh, depending on where, of course, your building is located, uh, your ULP or city might already have some requirements. Uh, but if not, um, unfortunately, a gap right now where um, if your city is not asking for it, then it's difficult for you to uh, officially get a uh, compliance uh, you know, registered building. right? But that should not really stop you from uh, making a building that is BCBC compliant because, as I said, uh, if not now, another year, two years, this is a process that is coming and uh, you will be sort of, um, you know, the first mover leading in sort of understanding and building uh, a, an ECBC compliant building. Sure. Uh, then, thank you. The next question is, should be fairly simple, but uh, since it's been raised, it's good to respond to it. Are there any examples of implementation available in India as a city? Sorry, are the examples available? Compliance or implementation? Um, absolutely. There are uh, a number of buildings that are now ECBC compliant uh, at the state level. Uh, you know, Telangana and Andhra Pradesh have done a lot of work. But apart from that, also, uh, because uh, the code compliance is really a part of the green building rating systems. Um, there are lots of other buildings that have come up, which uh, I'm sure there are enough examples online that can be accessed. Um, we can send that information across if we did. Uh, yeah, I want to add a, a lot of uh, documentation of examples of making buildings ECBC compliant exist online, as well as you could have sought your uh, state SDA to access additional so this this should this should be fairly easy to find if this is what they want to know more about. Um, and a question that uh, I'm used to being asked at municipal levels from the authorities, UAPs. Uh, what would you advise the city official for asks? How does the ECBC compliance procedure benefit the city or the UN? Uh, sure. So there are um, absolutely multiple benefits of code implementation, right? Um, the, the easiest, sort of the most visible one that we understand, of course, is for the building owner and the occupant in terms of energy savings and costs, right? But uh, if we extrapolate it to the city level, um, cities have to collect data, have to be competitive to businesses, uh, to, to you know, commercial centers setting up. There's an electricity requirement, and um, each individual building adds up to how much the city needs um, in terms of electricity. And that's just at the electricity level. You reduce electricity, all of you know, the city is facing pollution, cities facing higher temperature in inner city areas. The more ACs we have, the more heat it generates, the more ACs we need again. All of this is, you know, and its impact on environment and climate change. All of this is connected to how much energy we are using. So really, uh, the benefit to the city uh, is, I mean, it's is, is evident if we see it collectively beyond not just a single building um, where we think it's really the occupant or the owner that is benefiting, the city is benefiting. Um, and this is the reason why cities are taking the lead in all climate change and energy regulations because uh, uh, we are able to determine what is it that the city will benefit, not just in terms of energy savings, but its impact on all of these interconnected pollution and climate related issues. Um, I also want to sort of highlight that it might not be your specific department, but there are other ministries working on, say, the state action climate plans where building to future as a sector. Right? There are enough climate targets being set at the city and the state level which have a direct um, Sort of connection to the sector and the sector is uh, where the city is responsible for, for bringing about that change 
uh, and uh, finally, uh, I think you know, as cities sort of improve their data collection processes, there are state indexes being sort of uh, and city index cities are being ranked and rated. This is um, a great way of uh, cities taking the lead um, and uh, sort of showing that they're a comparative uh, destination for businesses and, and uh, industries to set up uh, with reliable power and uh, reduce costs for energy. Um, and this is the reason I think why they should sort of think about taking up um, the coal. And uh, just uh, one more thing, I think ULPs should also decide on the timeline of how and when they would go about doing this. If they need data to, to convince to get more funding, really look at the number of buildings that you know, the ECBC uh, mandates, so all 100 kilometer buildings that you are approving in a year, and that gives a very good estimate of the amount of energy savings that your uh, action would contribute directly to, to, the, to the city if all of those become uh, ECBC compliant. Um, Great, yeah. Thank you. Great answer. Um, yeah, I think uh, in any case, in coming time, we will probably have the residential homes also becoming mandatory and more and more focus on clean and efficient buildings, um, energy consumption. So it's uh, good for cities to already put in place the process uh, for the mandated CBC commercial. Um, but in future, one could look at other things. You can. So it's great. So yeah, so I think this is um, all that we wanted to discuss today. Uh, if there are any last comments that you would like to offer for now, we could we could then uh, close the discussion. So I think um, Thank you all, uh, all of the participants, as well as the great panelists to join us for today's webinar. Um, thank you, and we are closing the series of webinars. This has been a great experience, uh, getting questions from you and interacting with you on the work done on the field. Thanks, and bye-bye. Thank you.